and uh, I'm Linda Silka. Um, I'm very excited to have this opportunity uh, to introduce our speakers um, uh, this afternoon, um, and you're in for a wonderful talk, uh, just a wonderful talk. So the title of today's um, talk is Digging for Buried Treasures, Hidden Gems in Maine's Reuse Economy. And the speakers today are national leaders in this area. So you're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Cindy Eisenhower, who's an associate professor of anthropology and in the climate change um, Institute, and Dr. Bree Berry, who's a postdoctoral researcher in University uh, of Maine. And if you went around anywhere in the state and you asked who's doing really interesting work on the reuse economy, people wouldn't have to say, oh, I don't know. They point to them as people who are doing just really uh, wonderful work. So Mainers um, have been reusing goods for a long time. Think a little bit about your past weekend. Did you recycle anything? Did you go to a garage sale? Did you happen to drive down to Belfast? Because if you drive down to Be Belfast over and over again, you see places that have just stacks of stuff that um, they're encouraging reuse. So uh, there, there, but there are recent concerns uh, with climate change, resource scarcity, depletion, habitat, and biodiversity, and growing levels of waste. So think again about yourself and just think a little bit about what did you throw away this weekend? What did you put in the trash? So our speakers today have focused new attention on the potential for reuse to address unsustainable systems of production, consumption, and disposal. And they're gonna tell us about the results of a five-year research um, project and Cindy and Bree will outline the environmental, social, and economic dimensions of sustainability that are hiding in plain sight in Maine's secondhand economies. Um, and one of the things you'll see is there's so many um, disciplines and people that must work together, and they have been showing us how to have this happen. So we're going to get to hear um, some really great ideas, and we want to thank uh, Carol Hamill and uh, Ruth Hallsworth because they helped we wouldn't be able to have all of this happen without their help. So it's, it's really great. Now you'll wanna ask questions, but you're for the most part, not there in person. So we would love to have you start right at the very beginning and put comments in the chat. Um, and you can see that that's right in the middle at the bottom of your screen. Just write something in there and then we're gonna gather those up and ask questions at the end. Um, and uh, so, we're excited to have uh, Cindy and Bree just get started. Thank you. Thanks so much, Linda. Sure appreciate you. Um, thank you for the very nice introduction. <laughs> As always, you're too kind. Okay, let me just get my screen up here, slideshow from the start. Okay. Um, so, uh, as Linda said, welcome. We really appreciate y'all being here. Um, Bree and I are really excited to share uh, some of our research results with you. We've been working on this project for quite a while now. And while I wish we could present everything, um, we are trying to keep this at a high level today and, and just give you an overview of some of our findings. Um, so before we start, um, we would like to, to just recognize from the beginning here that we are located on Marsh Island. Um, this is, of course, the homeland of the Penobscot people, where issues of water and territorial, territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Uh, we recognize that the Wabanaki, the Malasi, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot tribal nations are distinct sovereign legal and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. So let me just start by outlining the presentation today. Um, first, we're going to give you a quick overview of the rationale for the study and outline our methodological approach. So our work folded out across scales um, over a five-year project that began with national level analyses. Then a wide array of tools that we used um, were designed to pilot methods for the study of reuse here in Maine at the state level. Um, and then we moved into the more traditional anthropological domain of community level study, where deep community engagement um, and participation inform observations 
um, of societal structures and the diverse values that really give meaning to the people um, who create and make up our reuse economies. So there are a number of rationales for this project. Um, I'm an anthropologist and I'm focused really on the juncture of economic and environmental policies. So I was interested in the potential for reuse and for secondhand market, markets to enhance resilience. So when we face shocks or um, disruptions in our markets, we wanted to explore the claim that this could help build resilience, but also that community-based um, networks of reuse could potentially even build social capital and, and um, enhance community trust. So our work was informed also um, by established research, which suggests that expanded reuse networks and markets could be a partial answer to some of society's most pressing challenges. You've all seen pictures like this one, giant landfills teeming with waste, plastic films, single-use cutlery, couches, t-shirts, fast food wrappers, broken toys, and expired food. In a linear economy that pumps materials through extraction, production, and consumption and disposal systems, waste is literally piling up in our oceans, on our beaches, and in our bodies. Too often, waste is exported to countries with underdeveloped capacity to process it safely. In fact, waste and waste processing plants are often co-located with society's most vulnerable members. But when we look at our waste streams a little bit closer, we can certainly appreciate all of the residual value that is embodied by those things. Perfectly good objects that could be saved from the landfill. And in the process, potentially offsetting additional resource use, energy use, injustices, emissions, and toxic outputs. So the potential environmental benefits of reuse have been well established by the research community, as well as governmental and intergovernmental um, organizations. We know that it makes a lot more sense from a total materials and pollution perspective to focus our efforts on waste reduction and reuse. So up higher on the hierarchy before we move down on the waste hierarchy toward processes that capture only a fraction of the value that's left in a discarded good. The focus on reuse also acknowledges significant growth in materials use over the past century with links to more than 50% of greenhouse gas emissions. The various materials that we use to make consumer goods end up constituting about 75% of the municipal waste stream, not to mention all the upstream resources wasted in the extraction and production and distribution of those goods. It's astounding to me, and I'm sure you all would agree, that about 90% of what we buy in the US is buried or burned within six months of sale. But this waste, wasteful system is not predestined. There are strong historical precedents and promising social movements that open our imaginations to very different ways of meeting economic needs without all this waste. One study by Samantha McBride, for example, suggests that strong reuse programs have the potential to reduce municipal waste by up to 25%. So um, before, so that's the rationale, um, part, just some of the reasons why we were interested in studying reuse. Um, but before we turn to an outline of what we actually found or our methodology, I, I wanna just be really clear about what we mean when we're talking about reuse today. So when Brie and I talk about reuse, um, we are not talking about recycling. So recycling breaks a product down into its component parts. And often in order to make something new, it requires significant inputs of labor, of energy, of water. So for us, we're talking about reuse that entails the redistribution of a previously owned material good in its original form. Um, so this is, would be from one agent to another, and that transfer could be through ownership, it could be through a lease or a, a rental or a loan. Um, we would also include in our definition activities that would be considered preparing for reuse. So that would be cleaning, restoration, repair. Um, some things we don't include, we don't include repurposing. So that's when you would, for example, take like an old tire um, and turn it into the base for a tetherball pole. Um, we wouldn't include that because, at least in this project, because it doesn't um, imply a change of ownership. We are um, interested in the materials, of course, but Brie and I, uh, our project today has been really been focused in on the exchange itself and the value of those exchanges and the labor that's um, entailed in them. So um, to try to get a better sense of some of the um, hidden treasures in, in Maine's reuse economies and economies more broadly, we used a variety of methods um, 
at the national, state, and local level. Um, so again, we have a lot more than we can present to you today, but we, we do hope to hit some of the highlights. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, before we begin that this work would not have been possible without the support of the National Science Foundation, the University of Maine's Climate Change Institute, uh, the Mitchell Center, uh, the University of Maine's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and uh, the Department of Anthropology. All of these institutions have provided invaluable support, um, but uh, of course, any op uh, opinions, findings, or conclusions that we express today are our own and, and don't necessarily reflect the views of the institution. Um, I also want to be sure to thank um, Bree and I have been working with an incredible team of folks over the past five years. Um, this is um, just a small fraction of them shown here. Um, other faculty um, across different colleges, but I'd like to in particular note that we've had 11 undergraduate students involved in this work, um, including through a field school and four graduate students um, to whom we are very appreciative. Okay, so I want to um, open a discussion of our findings with the, our earliest finding, which came uh, uh, as a bit of a surprise to us. Uh, we, this key finding emerged when we were designing the study. <laughs> we found that reuse is really hard to measure. Um, the way that we describe and measure our economies here in the US and in many other economies tends to be based on what we would call a productivist logic. And this is the idea that value is generated through the production of a good and its first sale. So GDP calculations, for example, see absolutely no value in a TV three months after it's sold. But is this an accurate representation? We would say no. So this limited understanding of value not only discounts the material itself, but it also ignores the distributive labor that we would that is associated with moving resources from where they are not needed or wanted to where they are. So um, this is a common practice in communities of all sorts. I know you've all taken part in this distributive labor. Other complications in our efforts to describe value in the reuse sector included an industrial coding system that only captures a small fragment of reuse. So for example, NACE codes, the standard industrial codes that we use to describe our industries, there's one for used merchandise and it helps. But what about, for example, here in Orno, Rose Bikes or Epic Sports in Bangor? These are both categorized under sporting good equipment retail, but they also sell used bikes and skis. So they wouldn't be included in this used merchandise NACE code. They would be primarily um, associated with um, sporting equipment. You can add to that other instances like pawn shops, which is categorized under financial services. And then what about the whole informal sector that isn't captured at all um, and includes uncountable Facebook marketplace listings, pass me downs to younger cousins and that side table you found at the transfer station. Another early lesson for our team was that not only is quantifying the value of reuse difficult but that some forms of value simply can't be reduced to numbers. We'll get to some of this rich qualitative data later in the presentation. Okay, so first let's um, get to the national level analyses that we did. And I wanna just say thanks to Dr. Andrew Crawley, who is my co-PI on this um, grant. He couldn't be here with us today, so I'll be presenting um, some of his slides. But the first thing we did is we wanted to look at a national level and say, okay, what's going on with the reuse sector? And so here are just some quick numbers um, across the United States for this um, used merchandise NACE code. We see employment of around 200,000 people, um, payroll over 3 billion, um, total revenue over 16 billion. Um, and we can see that while the number of establishments has kind of varied over time, uh, since 2010, we've seen pretty significant growth in employment in the reuse sector. Um, and I wanna just mention again, I mean, these are substantial numbers, but when you think about this as just those used merchandise stores and doesn't capture all of the other um, types of reuse that we mentioned previously, uh, this is a very, these are all very conservative estimates. We also wanted to look um, at the, this NACE code um, for used merchandise and look at how strong is the reuse sector um, relative to the economy of a particular state. So. Um, Andy performed analysis called um, location quotients, which basically is a 
looks at the number of reuse establishments relative to the total number of establishments in the state. So it gives you like a ratio of how strong is that um, sector relative to the um, other establishments in the economy. And we did see some really interesting patterns emerge. Um, these, we're just showing you here two snippets, 2016 and 2020, um, but we looked back 12 years at these and we saw some interesting patterns emerge. Um, we see that rural states um, tend to have consistently stronger secondhand markets. We also saw that states with older populations um, have stronger reuse markets and those, those states, there aren't very many of them yet, but those states who do have reuse policy um, have big, been getting stronger. Their reuse sectors have been getting stronger over time. So some interesting kind of hints at what, um, you know, what might help to grow or reproduce or support a reuse economy. Um, we also, um, Andy did a kind of county by county level analysis of formal reuse establishments relative to other local um, economic factors and, so, and demographics. And we did find some um, interesting patterns there as well. Um, so for example, communities or counties that have um, lots of women with young children, um, slightly older population distributions and higher level of income, those um, factors tended to be associated with stronger reuse uh, markets. Interestingly to us, um, two factors that we thought would probably have a correlation um, were income and economic output. We assumed um, that counties with lower income, average income, would have higher reuse um, because we assumed that reuse was associated with um, economic need primarily. We also, and, and same with economic output, uh, we, we, we assumed that um, the more economic output in a county, the less reuse there would be. Um, but we see in both of these that there is no significant effect. So this really raised an interest, oh, but unemployment levels um, did have an effect. So the, the higher the unemployment, the more likely there was to be a strong reuse market. So all of these, this data really raised some really interesting questions for us. And, and I would want to just be clear, part of the reason we're asking a lot of these questions is to try to think about like, how can we support reuse? How can policy or practices or programming um, support reuse? And in order to do that, we need to understand what helps strong re reuse markets to emerge. So in looking at some of these observations at the county level, we noticed that there was a common assumption in the literature that reuse markets are gonna be stronger in economically depressed communities. There is a con common assumption that reuse is really tied to um, economic need and that people do it because they don't have any other, um, any other options. But, and so the idea was that um, reuse is counter cyclical. And this would be the, basically the idea that as an economy contracts, a specific industry, and in this case, reuse grows. Um, and we, Andy saw this as we looked through the literature that that was the common assumption. But given the findings that we've seen, we wanted to ask like, what really comes first? If we know that high end levels of unemployment um, tend to be correlated with strong reuse, is there some sort of a causal mechanism there? Um, does low income mean more reuse? Is reuse counter cyclical, counter -cyclical to growth in the economy? So what Andy found um, is that it's pretty uneven. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I can't very well explain this graph to you. This is Andy's graph. Um, I'm happy to connect you with him. But um, as I understand it, this is um, these are all the states lined up and um, this is movement through time from left to right. And when the uh, it goes into blue territory below um, the plane, that's um, when reuse is, um, the economy is growing and reuse is dipping. And in other cases, we can see that the economy and reuse grow at the same time. So what we found is that it's really uneven. Sometimes um, reuse grows when the economy is growing and sometimes it contracts uh, when the economy contracts. But what we did find is that high income counties have seen the largest growth in the reuse se sector since the last recession. And this reflects a growing interest in reuse beyond economic rationalities. So while we might have assumed that reuse was just linked to um, you know, a lack of alternatives or um, economic necessity, 
Um, we are not finding strong support for that. So overall, our key findings um, in the national level analyses are that employment and revenue um, are being generated by the formal reuse sector. And it's substantial, but it's highly underestimated. Um, high reuse establishment density is linked to some demographic factors. So higher education, young families, but not to income, which was contrary to what we thought. Um, the reuse sector is not uniformly pro or counter cyclical. It's not just growing in bad times. And in fact, it's actually growing fastest in the high income counties. So when we were doing this work, we also noticed that Maine was interesting. Um, Maine consistently has a strong reuse market. Um, regardless of what's happening, you can see here over time um, that we were growing when there was a recession, uh, that the reuse sector was growing during a recession. But even um, during growth, it kind of leveled off and then continued to grow. Um, so here in the state, it seems that there is um, a strong kind of precedent for reuse. So I'm going to turn it over to Bree now, who's going to um, talk a little bit about um, what we learned at the state level specific to Maine. Great. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so we're going to kind of switch gears here and, and move into the state level analysis. So we used a wide array of methods, including a historical analysis, business and household surveys, and an economic impact analysis to explore diversity in the reuse sector and develop a methodology for study of the state level. And we wanted to do this particularly because the state and local levels are really where most reuse policy is situated. So I'll begin by sharing some of our historical analysis here. So this persistent and enduring culture of thrift really isn't new to Maine. We assumed there was a history there. And this is important because a large body of literature suggests that development programs and environmental policies tend to be more successful when they're implemented in ways that are consistent with local culture. But we found evidence to support our hunch, some of which was in memoirs, old magazines, historical newspapers, and in unexpected places like cozy cat mystery novels, um, which I'll share uh, shortly. The statement you see here said confidently by the self-proclaimed first antiques dealer in Maine, Fred Bishop Tuck, is that there is an old adage in the world of antiques that New England is the attic of America and that in turn, Maine is the attic of New England. We learned from Tuck's memoirs that he set up shop in Kennebunkport in the late 19th century and over time constructed images of Maine that suggested a differentiation between the most northeasterly state and other places customers might purchase used goods. Antiquarian Edwin Mitchell in 1939 wrote in his book, Maine Summer, that quote, it is the suggestion, the stirring of the imagination that makes visiting antique shops worthwhile. And there is, of course, always the chance of finding some treasure, end quote. So other depression era texts, the proverb, use it up, wear it out, make do or do without, emerged as an ethos of thrift commonly associated with New England. And many historical sources and ethnographies identified Maine culture as one of independent ingenuity, thriftiness, and taciturnity. Historian Mimi Killinger noted that Back to the Landers, Helen and Scott Nearing's lifestyle was, quote, extraordinarily austere, frugal, and out yankying the Yankee existence. But it's not just nonfiction texts or physical spaces where we use features prominently in characterizations of Maine. Secondhand stores are central in a recent fictional series, Sophie Ryan's Second Chance Cat Mystery Series. Sorry, Cindy, I'm skipping around, which is a multi-part collection set in a secondhand shop in fictional North Harbor, Maine. It includes references to used bookstores and pawn shops. Um, and the most recent contribution to the series is called Claw Enforcement from this year. But it's not all um, kind of this warm, fuzzy picture. A New York Times article dating all the way back to 1894 shows a darker side to reuse in Maine that helped us begin identifying ways that power and access complicate, complicate the idea of one culture of reuse in the state. What also emerged in other parts of the study and particularly in our ethnographic research were indicators that there was not simply a culture of reuse but many cultures and traditions and reasons for participating in this sector. This quote discusses how valuable objects were actually appropriated from unsuspecting Mainers. 
And this process is described as follows, quote, if she passes a house that looks as if it were old and had a fairly well-to-do, but not modern appearance, she drives up to it and asks for a glass of water. Her husband is usually made to perform that task and to take a look around. If the house looks promising, she alights and it takes but little maneuvering to get inside the house and once there to discover if there are any treasures. In the backwoods of Maine, the knowledge that old furniture is valuable has not yet penetrated. Thanks, Bri. So yes, we were able, it was really fun to do that historical and, and literary analysis, um, it, which really helped to kind of drive home that um, reuse has really been an important part of Maine culture for a long time. We um, wanted to try to understand um, how that culture of reuse has contributed to Maine's um, eco economic well-being over time um, and in, in the current moment. So we were trying to think of ways to um, measure the economic contribution of reuse that would allow us to tap into some of the informal forms of reuse that happen. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar, you know, or have participated in exchanges on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, or even just with your neighbors, um, which is really difficult to track through the formal sector uh, that we used in the um, national level analysis. So we also did a state level household survey. So we um, sent out surveys to a, a representative sample of Maine households and we got about 600 back. And in that survey, we asked folks to report yearly expenditures on secondhand goods and repair. Um, you can see here on the right that um, our uh, response, so the um, gray bars, mostly matched main population, but that our um, our respondent pool was a little um, little uh, bit wealthier. Um, we see that we didn't have as good as good of representation in some of those lower brackets. But so um, take that for what it's worth. Um, we're a little bit skewed, but. Um, our weighted averages for expenditures for reuse were about 1,018 per household on average. So that's about 570 million uh, per year in Maine. Um, repair expenditures were about 280 per year on average, uh, which totals about 156 million per year in Maine. So Andy calculated some multiplier effects um, for state-related ex expenditures and came out with um, about an additional 214 million in economic output and an additional 89 million in labor income. So this is a very conservative estimate, um, but we're, we're guessing that at about 726 million per year in Maine, um, which is a, a pretty significant economic contribution um, here in the state. We know that a lot of this contribution comes um, in terms of formal businesses. So we also um, early in the project did a, a survey of, and, and some interviews with um, main businesses in the reuse sector. Um, we, we sent out about 450 surveys and, and got about 74 uh, fully completed. Those 74 businesses were um, associated with 345 jobs. Um, what we do know is that um, the number of employees in a business is strongly correlated with um, their sourcing from donations and their annual gross sales revenue. Um, basically just meaning that um, the, the more employees, the more likely it is to be a donation-based um, uh, organization that processes a lot of goods um, or sells a lot. 81% of these businesses were really small, so had a gross revenue um, per year of less than $250,000. Um, so we did do interviews with 85 representatives from resource organizations as well. And all of this data kind of led us um, to ask some, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about motivations for participation. But the survey and the interviews together led us to ask some questions about um, what, how many people are participating in different forms of reuse. And I, th I thought it would be interesting to show you all just overall, this is, um, there are a lot of people participating in Maine. And um, you know we haven't done this research in other states, so we're not sure how typical or atypical it is, but um, we know that about 97% of the people uh, that responded to our survey um, give things away to thrift or charity. Um, a good portion of them give things away to friends and family. They also offer things at yard sales and sell on Facebook. 
Um, but another interesting find is that when we ask people how they get used goods, we see that people still participate, right? They get a lot of things at thrift and charity stores from friends and family, but not nearly as many people. So when you look at the total numbers here, um, it's much less. So we can see that um, only about 88% of respondents seek out um, or accept used goods. Um, this gap between the number of people who reported offering used goods and those who bought or accepted them helps to explain the glut of stuff and problems with storage that many reuse organizations talked about. Um, this glut also fuels our landfills and increasingly international exports of used goods, a, a, topic, to, a topic to which we're going to return in just a second. In terms of motivation, people participate in for all sorts of reasons, uh, which makes it really hard to generalize. Um, because the people and the avenues um, that they participate are, in are so diverse. So that said, we did find some interesting links between some variables and one's likelihood of selling or buying goods. So for example, the likelihood that one sells in reuse markets is strongly positively correlated with income, meaning that those with higher incomes were more likely to participate in the sale of goods, uh, perhaps because of the value of those goods. Another perhaps surprising result, um, particularly given what our participants told us, is that while age is not a strong predictor of selling behavior, younger generations were actually much more likely to participate in the purchase of used secondhand items. So state level analyses, key findings, um, we can have established clearly now that there's a deep culture of reuse in Maine. Um, it drives strong reuse regardless of economic trends. And this normative, normativity could be leveraged to support uh, reuse programming. Um, the economic contribution of household spending is actually really substantial, but small businesses here in our state face significant barriers that will require policy support if we want to um, further improve our reuse markets. Um, more people offer used goods than seek them out, uh, which contributes to an oversupply or a glut of used goods um, that could also be addressed by good reuse policy. And reuse organization surveys, surveys and interviews suggested that young people are not interested in reuse, but our household survey contradicted that, um, showing that young people um, participate in different ways, but we're much more likely to buy used goods. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it back to Bree, um, who's gonna talk about our community level analyses and some really interesting findings um, associated with her work um, in local um, reuse organizations. Thanks, Cindy. So um, as Cindy mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, our research included qualitative and ethnographic components to allow us to understand in a deeper, more contextual way, people's motivation for participating in reuse markets, barriers to participation in reuse, perceived changes in reuse markets over time, and how value really broadly defined is generated through reuse. So as part of our ethnographic research, we conducted 150 interviews with reuse participants including sellers, buyers, volunteers, regulators, and more. We also used participant observation, including buying, selling, and volunteering at reuse establishments to understand how reuse practices unfold in people's lived experiences. So we're gonna share some key themes from this part of our research now. So the image you see here is a network map of reuse in two rural Maine communities whose names have been changed to protect identities and privacy. The lines represent flows of used goods and the colored circles represent individuals, organizations, companies, and events. We're looking not at the movement of any one particular object, but at how things move through these places. From first glance, what you might notice is how dense this network map is. Objects are moving between people and organizations within these communities, as some organizations find value in the things others can't use or sell. Many things live long lives in the community, passing from one person to another, one organization to the next, via pretty complex pathways. I wanna highlight in particular one individual within this network who can help us think through the value of localized reuse. So Kaylee is outlined in that thick red circle in the, in the center of the map. And when we can see when we zoom in on her indirect network that she is getting and receiving things from a local nonprofit thrift shop, and that she redistributes used things to a network of friends. She also sells some items at local sales and donates textiles through a local provider. Through her participation in reuse, Kaylee is connected to the larger community. Each of the links in this map is a social connection, a way that people give and receive stuff as a means of generating support, income, or sociality. 
Kaylee also sells some items on eBay to help her make ends meet. What's interesting here is that in terms of sociality, online sales are a terminating node. The social value of reuse is lost to the local community. These network maps paint a complex picture of social relationships, mutual aid, and community resilience. And we can frame that in monetary terms, which really tend to speak volumes for folks. So the nonprofit reuse sector in these two rural communities generates about $148,000 annually, which is roughly the parks and recreation budget of the town of Jordan, one of these towns that we studied. This money goes directly to community needs. Reuse organizations have literally built the town library, purchased an ambulance, provided infrastructural investments for local healthcare facilities, and serve ongoing needs like literacy programs for children, hunger relief, community suffer suppers, and more. In dollars and cents then, reuse is really critical to these rural communities. But we do tend to value what we can measure. And while it's a bit easier to measure the financial contribution of reuse to these communities, I'm gonna argue here that the social value of reuse is no less important. I'm gonna share with you some of the themes that emerged from our qualitative data analysis of this ethnographic research. And I wanna note that in what follows, I'll be using the words of some of our participants themselves to explain the themes. These quotes represent themes that came up again and again. The idea that reuse builds community, creates trust, and generates opportunities for civic engagement. I'll also share an emerging theme about concerns people have about the sustainability of this sector as volunteers age and the work becomes more difficult for people to pursue. Okay, so here one participant highlights why we don't tend to see the social value of nonprofit localized reuse. He was one of many participants to share the idea that the sector is powered predominantly by elderly women, and this work tends to go unseen. He says, it does not surprise me even a little bit that as a community, we haven't got a clue about what's going on there because it is so freaking complex. And it's also completely below the radar, you know? And it's because it's a bunch of old ladies doing it. If it was guys with ties doing that stuff, it would be like civic awards and they'd be standing up, right? but that's not the mode at work here. This idea is well supported in the academic literature on women's labor, especially related to the unpaid work women do to care for elders, children, and homes. We see the same kind of devaluation of reuse labor where the hard and valuable work of mostly unpaid women goes unseen and uncounted. We also found that reuse practices related to care for community and to relationships of trust. Many reuse organizations give stuff away with the promise of later payment. These types of transactions were described over and over again in reuse establishments and differ substantially from what a shopper might experience at a big box retailer, for example. So there's two examples here of trust between sellers and buyers of used goods. One seller says, if somebody comes in and they need something and they didn't have any money, I'm like, well, take it and bring it when you get some money. And then I forget and they always come back and pay me and I forget all about it. Another seller says, a girl was walking by and there was a little dresser. She goes, well, how much is it? I said, well, about 10 bucks. She said, I wish I had the money. I said, take it, come back Thursday and pay me. So I just wrote her name down and put $10. If she comes back, she'll bring the money. If she don't, she don't. Somebody's got a little dresser they can use. Here we can see that trust and community is also an investment in social well-being. But reuse also gives people an opportunity to give back to their communities. Volunteering in a nonprofit reuse organization lets people build and maintain social relationships and contribute to the civic life of their community. One volunteer said, well, for me, it's activity, being with other people. At my age, I need to get out of the house and do something. And I do other things, but Wednesday, I'm away for four hours. I'm there at the thrift shop. I feel it's a duty that I have to myself, that I have to do this. Another volunteer coordinator says, when my head hits the pillow at night, I feel great. I know what I've done and what my volunteers have done has made life better for somebody. Reuse then is about more than finding a bargain, although that's really important. It's also about contributing in a positive way to the community. Okay, but despite all the really positive social dimensions we observed in localized reuse economies, there are certainly areas of tension. For example, volunteering can be exhausting as one participant describes. She says, some days, most days, I feel really gratified that I've used my ability to make money for this organization that does so many good things. But there are times when I resent it because I do work so hard and other people don't. This frustration is often linked to the lack of young people involved in localized reuse organizations. 
Another participant describes the issue he sees, saying, all volunteers will tell you, all volunteer organizations will tell you the same thing. It's hard getting young people to volunteer. If I looked around, our youngest member is probably like 50 years old or something. And reuse is hard work. It involves sorting through a seemingly unending flow of stuff, lifting heavy bags, hauling unsuitable goods to trucks or dumpsters, hanging and displaying items, and it never seems to stop. And this exhaustion is exacerbated by the fact that many of the localized nonprofit reuse organizations are run by elderly volunteers. While they are seeing more and more donations, the work is getting physically harder with few young people stepping up to fill in volunteer roles. One man who generates thousands of dollars each year for a local nonprofit by sorting, hauling and selling books tells me, I think it keeps me alive. I enjoy it, I really do. And I do know at my age, I've got to get somebody because I can't do it forever. You know, I'm 87 years old now. As long as I'm able to keep doing it, I will do it. But I know realistically that I've got to talk somebody into it. And I've got my eye on a couple of people, younger people. Another participant told me almost cheerfully about the challenges she sees, saying, the older you get, you know, these birthdays keep coming and I get less and less energy. So there's enormous social potential in reuse economies, but there's simultaneously really hard work. Without adequate policy support and community engagement, these long held traditions of reuse may be at risk. So I wanna share some key findings here with some policy implications from our community level analysis. And I'll start by saying that not, this research demonstrated that not all reuse is equal. The social relationships generated from localized reuse are not present in the same way with online marketplaces. Reuse is also really labor intensive, as I mentioned, and at the community scale, this essential labor is often unpaid. As volunteers age, it's becoming harder and harder to perform this difficult work. Also wanna highlight that reuse is uh, deeply networked, meaning that its potential is greater as the network grows. So reuse can really um, offer opportunities for reuse to proliferate. Um, it's kind of fun that way. And finally, reuse is often hidden in plain sight. Finding ways to support localized reuse can offer diverse forms of value for communities that go far beyond just waste reduction. So we're gonna end there and we, we really welcome your questions and um, engagement and wanna thank you all for, for being here today. Ken, this is Linda. Uh, can we all give them a hand, even though they can't see us, can we give um, um, them a hand? What a great, great talk. So what I'm going to do now is to, um, uh, take some of the questions that appeared in chat um, and we'll also get some uh, questions uh, from people who were able to be in the room. But first, um, I'd like to start just by um, saying that one of the comments in the chat was, wow, this is awesome. Thank you so much for your research on this critical section. Um, so uh, somebody really um, saying this, uh, this really worked for them, that this was really helpful. Uh, another person um, listening, Heather uh, from Goodwill, said that the demographic findings really meshed with their data. And that really does, uh, and that what um, you were finding also supports what they're finding and, and that she was glad to see that. Another one of the comments, um, um, and it asked for um, some um, comments from, from you, um, Cindy and Bria. So the transfer stations can be uh, hesitant to open swap shots, shops. Um, the reasons seem to include things like having to clean the things, having to organize them. And do you have any advice in terms of um, what to do here? Bri, I'm gonna throw, thanks, Linda. I'm gonna throw that one to you since you uh, re actually, Bri actually wrote a, a guide on um, transfer stations for the um, MRRA. Yes. Maine Resource Recovery Association. Thank you. I yeah. couldn't get it out. <laughs> I'm here. here all day, Cindy. Yeah, so um, you're right. And um, I think that really lines up with some of the, 
um, findings we were saying about reuse being really labor intensive. Um, so swap shops at transfer stations take energy um, and person power to maintain. Um, they get messy, stuff gets broken and gets left there accidentally or on purpose. Um, so there are best practices that we can learn from uh, transfer stations that are doing this really well. Um, some have really vibrant swap shops that are a real community resource. Um, they often have kind of a civic task force behind them, volunteers who are able to come in and keep things clean and keep things moving. They also tend to have strong municipal support for the uh, swap shops um, at the transfer station. Um, so the transfer station managers have to welcome that uh, presence there. And if they don't, then it's not likely to succeed. Um, but if you want to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to share the guide that was produced um, aimed at helping municipalities and rural communities think about swap shops and repair efforts. And I want to just add one thing that I, I'm not sure is in the guide, but we, we have noticed that municipalities that it takes a certain ideology too, meaning that like swap shops tend to do be happier with their swap shops if the ideology is just get this to someone who needs it and get it out of the waste stream rather than um, getting upset if they feel like one person maybe is taking too much or you know that they're that someone is taking advantage of the system. Um, so I think it, it involves a bit of an ideological orientation toward just reducing waste and and assuming that people who are taking a lot um, need it or will get it to a better place. Thank you. Another um, point, uh, you talked so, so clearly about um, that there are many cultures um, of reuse and that the motivations are diverse. Um, how do we use that information going forward? What, what do you think, say communities, um, how, how could they understand that and really put something into action based on that? And you can say, who knows, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think that there, um, Bree and I have, have been, you know, working on this topic for a long time and, and we do have lots of examples of communities at the local level, at the state level, at, at you know, the federal level who are implementing reuse policies um, and to kind of build upon not only the social value, uh, but also the, economic contributions. So we see everything from like Sweden has a tax rebate for people who repair their goods rather than um, replace them. We see cities like Portland, Oregon that do materials exchanges and um, programs for um, repair job training. So there are all sorts of things that can be put in place at different levels and, and they do seem to really be um, you know, working in a lot of cases. And Linda, if you don't mind, I, I did want to, I just saw Dylan's um, comment in the chat and I'd love to address that one. Um, so Dylan asks, you know, even though ben, uh, reuse is beneficial to the consumer and community, wouldn't an increase in the buying of reused goods lead to a decrease in demand for production, um, which could cause job reductions and unemployment? And that's, I think that's such an important question, Dylan. That's the question that most policymakers will ask first um, when you, you know, advocate for reuse. And it's really interesting. And it's part of the reason we wanted to do the economic contribution analysis. Um, there are quite a few studies now out that suggest that it moves money into different places, right? So we might um, have less first order production, um, which tends to be, production that's not, doesn't accrue a lot of localized benefits uh, or less fewer localized benefits. Whereas um, secondhand markets and reuse exchanges do tend to happen at a more localized level um, and can build employment and build income um, that stays a little more localized. So there, there needs to be more work done there for sure. But um, just for example, one study in Minnesota um, showed that the reuse and repair economy in the state um, outweigh it was contributed more revenue um, than the entire mining sector of the state. So if we could measure, wow. you know, reuse and repair, well, I think we, we would be able to show that there, these are really um, activities that are worth investing in, even if they don't, um, you, know, you know, even if they aren't consistent with that kind of productivist idea of we've got to create new stuff to have value. So thanks for the question. Uh, thanks for your response. 
Hi, uh, Tony, do you yes, have... we have a question here. If that's yeah. okay. okay, and I'm going to try and give the microphone to them so you can hear it in their, their words. So one second. So I'm from New Jersey, and the way I was raised is that if you're done with something, you don't want it anymore, you just kind of, with these old clothes, you just throw it in the washer and you donate it. So you don't throw out anything unless it's fully unusable or broken beyond whatever. And I'm just curious if you found any reason behind people who throw out like perfectly good objects because that, like I didn't realize anyone did that because everyone I know kind of like they'll just donate their old stuff if they don't want it or sell it. Yeah, and um, I, it's an interesting question um, because we're getting people who are participating in the sector, not necessarily people who are not. Um, but I will say that one, one problem that we found emerging quite a bit through this research is um, people who donate their objects no matter what, like this persistent like culture of thrift actually becoming a problem where people can't bear to throw anything away. So they donate things even when maybe all of its use value has already been extracted. So I can give you an experience from the ethnographic research that I did in a local thrift shop where I um, opened a bag up of donations. I was volunteering with the women who do a lot of this work. And um, it was, uh, you know, like soiled underwear um, and things that were just full of holes. And it was clear that someone couldn't bear to throw that away, even though there's no use that we can make of that, right? That's not an object that can be resold. Um, and I'm, I'm actually curious that on, on both of those spectrums, right? Why is it that people are throwing away things that are still useful, but why is it that people are donating things that have been used up? Um, and I think it, there could be um, a kind of relationship there where people are worried that their items aren't useful and so they throw them away or they can't see the value that's still in them. And on a kind of the flip side of that is people have such meaning um, and value attached to objects that they can't see that other, other people might not be able to realize that. So one of the things that um, people found really interesting is um, the generational differences um, that uh, you were finding that, that uh, people who were mature in age were say more involved um, with the reuse uh, economy than people who were, who were younger in age. Um, did you assume or did your research say anything about whether that's about a particular um, time that people grew up or that we'll all move as we get older, we'll become more interested in a reuse economy? So I think, um, well, let me just tell you a little bit more as a, as a means of answering the question. So we heard initially in the reuse business interviews and surveys. So these, these are owners of reuse businesses that they were really lamenting the um, lack of young people. Um, they weren't interested, right, in reuse. And Brie also in her work in the thrift shops oftentimes you know, heard a lament that young people weren't involved as volunteers. Um, so I think what we know is for a lot of the owners, they, they did kind of grow up with a mentality of, you know, waste not, what not. Um, but I think that some of their concerns were a bit misplaced. And we've seen this in a lot of different ways now, um, meaning that young people are participating and many of them very heavily, but just in very different ways <laughs> than what the, some of the reused business owners would have expected. So um, Bree and, and I and, and another graduate student, Emily uh, Scruton, have been doing um, some interviews of um, folks heavily engaged in, in reuse and resale. And those folks um, very engaged, but they're doing it primarily through online platforms, um, oftentimes you know, working with donations and then moving, uh, moving to resale. Um, we see a lot of young people that are um, participating in particularly like um, textile resale, um, but they aren't as interested in, for example, their grandparents' china or collectibles. Um, like we tended to at one point in time to associate with um, reuse. So I think there's just a shift um, 
Now, to answer your question, Linda, about whether people as they get older have a greater appreciation for reuse, I don't know that we have strong data there. Um, but what we do know certainly is that as pe folks get older, they tend to be less interested in buying um, used things, but they also tend to be less interested in buying things in general. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Bree, do you want to add to that? Do you think I missed anything there? Yeah, I think yeah. We're, I think we're seeing um, that it's more complex than just um, a, a spectrum, right? There's times in people's lives when they participate really heavily, and those times can't be totally predicted. But yeah, young folks just starting out, um, people with kids participate really heavily. And then um, how you participate really changes, right? Uh, so we, we saw a lot of our older participants who are trying to get rid of a lot of really meaningful things to them um, later in life. Hi guys, I'm Sarah Delaney. Uh, I'm wondering, getting back to your original thoughts about climate resilience and what your research has pointed to there. And also, oh, maybe it's the same or different to like community resilience to other disruptions like economic disruptions we saw from or were seen from the COVID pandemic and how like a more vibrant reuse economy helps build resilience to either or both challenges. Thanks, Sarah. I started on the last one, Brie. You want to start this one? Sure. Um, we started this project thinking a lot about resilience and um, actually the last couple of years have been really interesting in terms of thinking about connections between reuse and resilience with the onset of the pandemic. Um, and it was maybe a kind of perfect, uh, imperfect storm um, with the, the labor needs of reuse and the kind of characteristics of many of the ways that people get and get rid of things being really personal. It, it kind of illustrates how social these economies are because they became um, kind of dangerous for folks to participate in. A lot of the really small shops, for example, um, had to shut down because there was no way to safely so socially distance or ventilate um, properly. Um, so we can see these as um, kind of engines of rural resilience, but also um, kind of vulnerable social infrastructure as well. I think they're both things at the same time. Um, but in terms of climate resilience, um, I think we see great potential there. And maybe I'll let Cindy um, elaborate on that a bit more. Sure, I mean, I think, um, I know we were just have a minute left, but I, I think we see a lot of um, kind of discussions about resilience in our qualitative data. So we see a lot of people um, talking about reuse as giving them an option when there were no other options left. So um, either because, you know, they, they lost a job or because they, you know, reuse is very easy to get into without much of a capital, um, you know, investment. But um, in terms of climate, yeah, I mean, I think we've seen with COVID and all these supply chain disruptions, more and more discussions about localized supply chains and localized procurement. And so I, I do think that, um, yeah, it, there's, there's lots more potential there that we haven't tapped into yet. Um, thanks for the question, Sarah. Well, we've run out of time. <laughs> uh, and there are many more uh, questions um, and uh, much, more so, I I, I think uh, Bree and Cindy, you'll be hearing from people um, because this was just so very very interesting, and um, um, I hope that all of you, as you leave wherever you are while you're listening, you think about who do you want to share what you heard, um, who's a impactor, who's somebody who could make a a, a difference in terms of this information. What would you like to ask our speakers that you didn't get to, to, to ask? And how, how do we go forward in using all of this, this great work? Um, and um, which cozy cat mysteries do we want to read <laughs> as a way to get people going? So can everybody give our speakers a hand? And hopefully this is just the beginning of all of us working together, learning and thinking about how to continue this important work and learn from these scholars. So thank you so much. <laughs>